Hello, and thank you for joining us for week four of Rev Up 2020. I'm Ryan Schoenecker, SVP of Sales and Marketing for Revel. Uh, today's panel session is called Social Determinants Up Close and Personal. Before we jump in, a couple logistics. For those of you who haven't joined in the past, just keep in mind, if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function. There's both chat and Q&A. Please use Q&A, um, and we'll be answering those towards the end of the session, but uh, please put your questions in at any time, and we'll start to uh, pull those together. After today's panel, we're going to be having our Innovation Lab, which will be Scott McGill, President and CEO of Coriel Life Sciences, who will also be on the panel today, so you get to hear a little bit of information from him up front, and then more detail after today's panel. We will be recording today's session and have it out there on RevUpShow.com, which is where you registered for uh, joining RevUp. Also, there's going to be a brief survey as you exit, so please make sure to take the time and, and put some commentary in there. We do use that to help us improve every week over week and year over year with these. Uh, today we'll be live tweeting, so please feel free to join in the conversation at hashtag RevUp2020. And with that, I'm going to turn over to today's moderator, Sarah Ratner, to introduce us to our panelists. Sarah? Wonderful. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so today I'd like to introduce you to my four uh, panelists. The first is Craig Kennedy, CEO of Medicaid Health Plans of America. Second is Adeze Anekwichi, president of IPAC. Uh, Andrew Parker, founder and CEO of PAPA. And Scott McGill, president and CEO of Coriel Life Sciences. So thank you everybody for joining me. Craig, let's uh, get this started with you. Broadband is now referred to as a super determinant of health. This issue needs to be addressed before and as part of addressing the public health infrastructure that's contributing to social determinants of health. And these infrastructure issues impact someone's access to care, tendency or ability to get care and lifespan. What are some examples of things health systems and plans are doing to address this super determinant today? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, apologize for the background. Everybody else has these fancy backgrounds. I see what's going on here now. So uh, uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, my name is Craig Kennedy with the Medicaid Health Plans of America. It's a great question. It's exactly the one of the social determinants of health that we talk about um, is access, right, and, and how people access care. And telemedicine, telehealth, and broadband services in particular is very, very diverse across this country. People just seem to think, uh, just on a blank note, everybody has a smartphone, everybody has an iPhone, and everybody has unlimited broadband access and, and high speed. And that's just not the case. It just isn't the case. And so we have such a wide diversity of access through these, um, through these mechanisms that people take for granted that all of a sudden you get to telehealth. You get to a COVID problem, right? You get to a COVID time, a pandemic, where you say, you know what, we're going to move a lot of our healthcare access to um, telemedicine and telehealth. And everybody goes, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, it makes a lot of sense to just move it over, have this virtual, let's figure out how to do this in a better virtual environment. But people don't have access to that. And so, and especially the populations within Medicaid, right? You have a low income, a disabled and elderly population, that, that may, may or may not have the access to broadband that you mentioned, or may not have the technical skills to, to accomplish what we would need to have to have a secure telehealth visit that, that they would substitute for a regular in-person visit during a non-COVID time. So we look at, we look at the times like today and, and, and intuitively you think, oh, let's move to telehealth. This is a great way to get more people access to care um, but, the, but as you pointed out, broadband, the technology, those things are just disparate across the country. And it isn't even rural urban, right? It's not like, oh, this is just a rural problem. Um, this is both, right? The technology, the infrastructure, um, people just seem to assume, every, like I said, everybody has that iPhone. We have plans in dense urban areas where people don't have access to telehealth capacity. We definitely have it in rural areas. We have plans that are giving out phones, giving out tablets, giving out these things, paying for broadband access. We, of course, use the FCC Lifeline program to help support a lot of those things. Um, but, but we sit there and we say, okay, our patients don't have access to the care that they need and we need them to have. Some of these are, some of these are, uh, we do home visits, right? We go into, and I know Andrew will speak to this later, we have to go see some of these patients in person. 
Um, how do you do that? And you just think, oh, telehealth. But what, what doesn't come to mind right out of the gate is, do they have the adequate access to that broadband infrastructure? And oftentimes that's just not the case. And so you're exactly right on a social determinant measurement within a COVID-19 global pandemic, everybody goes, yes, we can make this transition over. Um, in many cases, we can't. We want to, we want to, we want to facilitate this, but, we, but, but the health plans of the world aren't gonna uh, redesign the infrastructure of broadband across this country to be uniform for everybody in the, in the country to access. Um, so how do we make through it? Um, it's a case by case basis. And so you really have to sit there and say, what are my patients in this instance need to access care that they need um, through, the, through the infrastructure that we have? Um, and, or can we help that? Can we give them the phone? Can we give them the tablet? Can we walk them through the training on how to use it? So it's, it's, <laughs> there's a lot of different things within the social determinant space to look at, but broadband infrastructure right now during COVID-19 is incredibly, incredibly important and disparate. It's, it's so true. Um, so, you know, a day's a, with the increased focus on teleservices, there's a much greater distinction between the haves and the have nots. You know, we lament at times that we get kicked off of uh, internet. We, you know, it's not fast, but really we are all very fortunate. Um, what needs to exist to bridge this tech gap? Thanks, Sarah. It's a, it's a great question, and um, I'm eager to have this wonderful conversation with this group of esteemed uh, panelists. My, my, you know, as we've talked about this in the last several months since the pandemic, you know, we uh, every point Craig just made is is, is spot on. But one of the issues that I'm starting to grapple with um, is that we use telemedicine or telehealth uh, to mean a lot of different things. And I think usually we're talking about the video interaction. But as Craig just mentioned, that will not do for every single enrollee or member or employee, right? We probably have a number of large employers participating in today's uh, discussion. So we have to think about the user, right? The customer. How do you meet them where they are? Telehealth can certainly be about video and, you know, a, a conference much like we're having right now. But, you know, there are some there's some concerns with that. Usually for HIPAA compliance, you're logging in to have a conversation with your physician through uh, a platform. Uh, it requires setting up something through a portal. It's probably not that user friendly. So we have to think about accessibility and making it user friendly. And if you're talking about a, an MA population, making it user friendly for, an, for older Americans, that's very, that's critical. All of us live on Zoom or GoToMeeting or Microsoft Teams, and everybody right now in America can write a book about how easy um, it is to just smoothly log on to a, a video conference with, with, without a hitch. And that book would be full of multiple chapters with all the different kind of hitches and glitches you can run into, right? So what exactly are we expecting our seniors to engage with when they're logging in through some of these platforms that haven't necessarily been tested with that particular patient population. So that's one form of telehealth. But we also have text messages. Craig just talked about everybody has a phone. Everyone doesn't have a smartphone. Some people just have a phone, but I think most phones get a text message, right? And can send, you can use them to send text messages. An awful lot of communication, health communication can occur through text messages. So are we using that particular medium to its, um, its fullest potential? We also have phone, phone conversations. Uh, it's, I, I even stumbled upon that, right? Because so much of what we're doing is on video. We can actually dial and just have a conversation with our physician or nurse. How much of that are we, ma how much are we maximizing that version of telehealth? So the point I'm making is that what we need is not just to have teleservices, but to have the whole continuum. 
to recognize that there are pros and cons to each of them, try to address them. But if we focus on the end user, right, we, I, think, I think what it helps us do is to refine our service offerings as plans, as payers, as, employ, as employers to meet the needs. And I haven't even talked about language access, uh, but to the extent we are dealing with subpopulations where English is not the dominant language, we have to be thinking about accessibility to meet all of the people that we're serving. Otherwise, we run the risk of leaving a whole section of people behind at a particularly tenuous time, right? Like this uh, pandemic. That That's fascinating. It's I always find it um, an interesting conversation when we say, oh, all of a sudden, you know, CMS has approved telehealth services and it's like this is supposed to magically just come to all of us. And we really take for granted the, the infrastructure that's needed in order to support that universal access. So Scott, Along those same lines, um, employers are starting to adopt uh, pharmacogenomic strategies. And I think this is just a, a really interesting, fascinating area that's moving so quickly. Um, with COVID, employers are relying on in-home testing rather than going to a clinic these days. And people need telehealth to administer these tests. So what are you seeing in this regard, especially since we've discussed the disparity in the telehealth access? Sure. Um, I, I think fundamentally COVID has tested our infrastructure in a way that we've not seen, certainly in my lifetime. It's tested the healthcare system in a way that uh, has really illuminated a lot of the discrepancies and flaws that we have, um, which I think ultimately will be a good thing. I think this will force us to shore up gaps in our delivery models that, uh, you know, quite frankly, have persisted for, for a long, long time. Um, in the era of COVID, you know, the, the testing methodologies are still evolving. Um, right now, there are very few in-home tests that are available for COVID testing that don't require monitoring, meaning that you can get a kit at your house, but you still have to log into a video chat with a certified uh, technician or medical practitioner to watch you actually take that nasal swab sample itself and then put it in your mail. Um, that's obviously challenging for anyone who doesn't have broadband access. And so they're, they're necessarily crossed off the list there as people who could make uh, use of, of that kind of testing technology. And now they are forced to leave their homes and go to a clinic and um, find an available uh, clinician to actually administer that test. Um, that's particularly challenging now, but it is forcing innovation. And so we're seeing now uh, in-home saliva collection kits being developed so that it's not a nasal swab. It's just spit in a tube and then you can send that off. That's been for uh, quite some time our preferred method for pharmacogenomic testing. Um, which is this, which I'll talk about in the innovation lab in more detail, but um, focused on how we use genetics to uh, better tailor medications to individuals based on their physiological differences. But that common denominator is generally a post office box or a mailing address. It's not an internet broadband access. It's not a smartphone. It's how can we actually outreach and bring healthcare to those individuals? Much like Adese was saying, when we think of telehealth, it's really not just technology, but how do we bring service and care to those people we can't otherwise reach? And in many cases, that is uh, through the mail, which is, uh, you know, that, that's, that's just what it is. But, um, you know, today we can actually do that for pharmacogenomics, not quite there yet for COVID, but coming really, really soon. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you, Scott. Um, you know, we know during COVID, there's been a huge focus on um, social isolation, especially with the elderly and their at-risk status. Andrew, let me turn to you. So following on the discussion of telehealth, um, with the social determinant of health data that's now being collected via Z codes, we know there's a strong correlation between living alone and managing chronic disease. You, your organization, Papa, started out doing on-site um, services to the elderly in person, I should say. Tell us about your focus these days and how you've pivoted into this tele-access space. 
Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, for us, I think we always saw virtual visits, as we call it, because it's not like a traditional telehealth service, as we're not providing, you know, by definition, a clinical service. But it's always been part of our organization's roadmap. My background is in telehealth. You know, for the past uh, eleven years, I started my career working at MD Live. You know, in the very beginning. So it's always interesting to see how far we've come. And I used to jokingly state that. You know, I don't think we'll see the telehealth adoption we expect until everyone got sick. And that, you know, was a joke uh, at the time, but I really expected that that to be, I didn't think that was going to happen, but of course, uh, ended up uh, being an accurate statement. And it really was because it forced the behavior change among both the health system, the providers, the payers, the employers, uh, as well as the individuals, which really was the last uh, frontier of adoption. We're seeing a very similar thing happen with virtual companionship. And so more now than ever, people are lonely and isolated. In fact, I would presume that, you know, however many people are on this call uh, are almost all isolated by definition. You may not feel lonely, but you'll be at a distance from other people. And thus, older adults, you know, seniors that are 65 plus for the first time ever are saying, you know what, I am lonely. I do want to talk to somebody. I do need help. And then while we're on a conversation with them, to Desi's point, could be a telephone call, could be a text, uh, could be a chat, could be a video call, or, you know, in some cases, if needed a in-person service, I'm able to request that experience and have it. And I actually feel less of a stigma about it uh, because the whole world is now in a position that I've probably been in for a very long time. And I think what's interesting is we bucket seniors into this category. Well, if you're 65 and above, you're a senior. My dad's almost 65. My grandma's 90. And they definitely grew up in way different generations and have different technical capabilities. Funny enough, my grandmother's more uh, <laughs> technically advanced than my father, but that's a whole other story. And so I think it's important not to think about like, how do we support seniors, but how do we support the nuance of an individual? And what's exciting about Papa, because we have moved uh, in a big way to virtual visits. We're doing over 50,000 virtual visits a day, uh, month, sorry, right now, which is pretty considerable considering, you know, 60 days ago, 90 days ago, we were doing all in-person visits. But now people are saying, I do need this support. And frankly, it's become part of our experience. And those that start on telephone or landline for that matter, we find out, do you have a smartphone? Do you have an iPad? Do you have broadband access. And if they do, the pals actually educate them onto video, which now opens up this whole world of other opportunities like behavioral health, like medical, um, you know, telehealth. And so I think it's exciting. I always see Papa and I know a lot of people consider their organization of such uh, as the front door of health. We're really proactively in the new member's home. If we need to sign them up for a, a test through Scott's program, we're able to do that. We may not administer it, but we become an advocate. And it's because it starts off with that initial interaction, which today is for the most part over telephone or through video. So it's been a very interesting thing for us. Do people um, call you or when they, you know, the pals meet with members, do they uh, ever ask you about, well, how do I get internet access or I'm having a problem because I don't have the right speed or how do I use it or who do I call? Do you, do you firefight those types of issues? All the time. And there's significant nuance. Some, some of it's focused on that. Some of it's completely like, I can't leave my house. How do I get my blood pressure medicine? And I'm part of a health plan. What benefits do I have? So the, the, the pals become kind of like ambassadors and advocates for improving healthcare outcomes. In addition to the fact that they're really there to be your friend and provide companionship. And with that trust, we're able to help positively impact their lives in other ways. Some people may never have access to broadband. Their health plan is not going to be able to help them, at least not today, uh, without Craig Kennedy's help. Um, you know, they're never going to want to do it. And it may take them a long time, but the pals are talking to them more than their provider, more than the health plan. And so we actually empower the health plan to go in and build this relationship to find out what they need. We recorded it in our experience. We pass it to the health plan. If that health plan has a service where they're deploying iPads to those that are able uh, to get access to the internet, we can inform that member of that benefit and actually enroll them in that program. So it's a really unique thing where on the surface, you know, we're very much a companionship company, but there's so many other things. I kind of think of the pals as ninjas, um, personally speaking. Do you, do you see plans trying to bridge that gap with providing that technology access or is that something that, you know, we hear about, but it's really happening on a much smaller scale? 
Well, I thought it was at a smaller scale, but then the other day I got a request uh, from one of, uh, through our, our sales team that a health plan's looking to deploy like 20,000 iPads and having the pals show up the same day that the iPad arrives at the house, show them how to use the iPad, you know, install the telehealth you know, app that's offered by their health plan, show them how to use it and you know, assist in their first virtual visit with either a pal or the telehealth provider. So it's super unique because a lot of this isn't complicated. And it's not like the seniors don't have the ability to do it. It just takes some time to sit with them and go through the process. Yeah, and some of that, I mean, I can't overemphasize, and Andrew's doing a great job of it too, of the importance of home and community-based services, right? Going into somebody's house and seeing how they're living from a health plan perspective, we're there for a health visit, right? But you're really there to see what all those things that are impacting their health and what are they trying to, what what would be helpful, right? And so that home-based visit is so important to the overall health and all of the social determinants they're facing because it varies by every individual. As Andrew could tell you, probably every single day, it varies by individual and we're there for a health visit. I got it, but we're looking at everything we can and, and all of a sudden that, that disappeared for months. It literally disappeared for months in the health plan space. Adult, uh, adult uh, daycare services disappeared. Home and community-based visits disappeared because people were afraid of, getting, of transmitting the disease over. And so everybody said, oh, telehealth. It just, it, it's still a transition. It's still happening. And so it, it, there's just so much work to get done from here to there. And, and like you started out with the conversation, there just isn't the same universal... Un- universal access in the broadband space. So it's not just this easy jump over and, and there's some loss there. So we have to keep doing a lot of these things that we want to do, which is go into people's houses and see how they're living and help them. Um, Just things are changing, right? Things are changing dramatically and we have to adjust pretty much on an individualized basis, as Andrew pointed out. It's, it's it's so interesting that how, um, how long it's taken us to get to where we are and how something so catastrophic has fast forwarded us into this, you know, telehealth vortex where finally we've adopted this, but we are still playing catch up as well. Um, so let me, let me pivot a little bit, Adeze. Um, along those same lines, we know the public health emergency declaration has given the ability to massively scale up telehealth emergency approval of new drugs, new flexibility of government-run health insurance programs, many, many different things. And this has been extended with the latest renewal that's set to expire in October. This also coincides with the beginning of the flu season, the election, potentially a COVID vaccine. What are the implications for a a renewal or expiration, Adeze? I'm so curious on your perspective around this. So it's a good question. And I had so many thoughts about social isolation and everything else we talked about, but I'll, I'll restrain myself. Um, this, I think one of the things we, we learn about a public health um, emergency declaration, which, you know, I've been part of one, right? When I was in the White House, we had to respond to um, Ebola and then subsequent to that Zika. And a public health emergency declaration unleashes um, essentially the federal apparatus for you to, for the country, the government to respond to a public health, a major public health crisis. So in this case, if we let it expire or if it expires in October, um, a lot of the things we've been able to see, like the loosening of some of the constraints around payment, uh, for telehealth services, um, the uh, ability to sort of um, fast track funding to the National Institutes of Health or to BARDA for, you know, for, the, for uh, PPE, because we are, we're, we're out, um, you know, and so a whole host of others to the CDC for some of the public health and community research and outreach that they're doing. We all of that is able to, to occur. I didn't even mention FEMA. A lot of the resources that communities are getting are actually FEMA dollars, which you're able to release and divert to respond to the public health crisis um, during a public health emergency declaration, which hurricane season is hitting, right? So if the emergency declaration stops, FEMA will, again, um, 
redirect its attention to and resources, right? Attention and money, because they haven't lost sight of the, the hurricane season. They're still dealing with that. So you find that the government is already stretched. A public health emergency allows flexibility. I mean, that's kind of the operative word, flexibility in how you address this confluence of um, uh, uh, tragedies is what's coming to mind, but really challenges. Once you let that expire, we retract, right? We go back to business as usual, when in fact business is anything but usual. So the November election is, you know, it's happening re regardless. What it does mean, I, however, I think in terms of seasons is um, you've got a flu season where most Americans don't usually get a flu shot. We'll see how behavior changes this year because we've got a huge uh, factor in a virus that looks similar at the very beginning to, the, to, the, to a cold or to a flu. And if misdiagnosed, can be quite deadly. Um, or missed if, it, if, if it's not diagnosed early. So we're, we're, we're gonna have a major challenge in our hands, irrespective of a public health emergency declaration. I think without, without it, um, and it lasts for a period of time, we've got delays in how quickly agencies and the federal government and subsequently hospitals and other actors in the system can quickly pivot to respond to what we know will be a very difficult fall with COVID alone, but it's gonna be COVID times flu. And that's going to be um, a really, I think, it, it, I think it just would be so much more challenging um, if we didn't have an adequate response, which we haven't had, um, just to be clear, but I think, you know, even less Less, um, even less of what we have, what we've had so far, I think, would be really challenging. Craig, you know, you you sit in the middle of this tsunami that Daisy is referring to, um, and you do a great job at it. How have some of the Medicaid plans relied on this declaration, and what are you hearing as to the fate of this? What what's going to happen as we approach the election and beyond? Um, I can't disagree with anything she just said. Let's put it that way. Um, but, uh, but what we've seen is that the, the waivers that specifically impact Medicaid are called 1135 waivers. And so, and, and as, she, as Adizi pointed out, the law says when the president makes a declaration and the secretary of health and human service makes the declaration, then this section of the law is activated within Medicaid and states can then apply for these 1135 waivers of a whole range of topics um, on an expedited basis. And so we're used to in the space having 1115 waivers and 1915B waivers and these state plan amendments and these normal kind of machinations that take a little while to happen and months to occur. 1135 um, is a different process and speeds up a lot of that. And CMS came out and said, um, if you wanna go for an 1135 waiver, here's what we will approve. <laughs> and it just had a checklist of things. But then they left it to the states to apply, to Adizi's point, which is they didn't tell them, we would love you to apply for these. They just said, this is what you could apply for. Come to find out all 50 states now have an 1135 waiver in. Um, they all have it just a little bit different. They've all done something a little bit different across the country. It's not a nationalized you know, approach to Medicaid, never seems to be. Um, and to that, and to the point about the declaration, that 1135 waiver authority is only available during the, the dual declarations from the president and the secretary, and then it ends. Now there is there is technically a, a a transition period that is available to the secretary to let it go for another 60 days after the approval of the specific waiver, what have you, um, and we are working on that every day, literally every day, what, what do we need to have that transition? Because to be fair, nobody knows when A, this pandemic ends, or B, when the declaration ends, right? Literally, those are two separate things, right? The declaration is very different than the actual pandemic in the space. And those are decisions that are made, you know, at the secretary and presidential level just is. And so, and it triggers different things within the law. How do we, 
whenever it, whenever we end up out of the declaration phase and we lose this 1135 transition authority or 1135 waiver authority, how do we transition? What do we want to keep? And does that take regulatory action or statutory action? I think that's the biggest question for us facing right now, because some of these, boy, I would love to be able to go back to CMS and say, we want to continue some of these transition policies or these, these policies that have really helped us with the populations we serve and, and, and have them be able to approve that. But sometimes it is not. Sometimes it is the statute that has to change. And obviously, you know, it's a little joke about what it takes to have an act of Congress, right? It actually takes a while. And so these transition things need to be planned now. Right, we need to have the thought that that as we mentioned, happening now, for what does that transition look like going forward? What is the step forward that you that you specifically mentioned? Like, what has been accelerated? What has been pushed forward that we want to keep? Right, I'm not going to sit here and say it's been a wonderful experience this pandemic. Right, that's just not true. Hundreds of thousands of people are dead, and so it's just and lives disrupted. Right. We look at the death rates, but you look at the lives disrupted, the, the entire infrastructure torn apart. Um, what is but what is it pushed forward within the healthcare space and really the human engagement space? Right, as Andrew pointed out, um, it's about bigger than health. This is bigger than a health question. What's that engagement strategy going forward that we can that we can leverage to keep going? And we're talking about that right now because literally, I don't know when those presidential and secretarial declarations will end and all of these authorities disappear. Well, if you knew that, then. <laughs> well, the last, the last extension she mentioned, uh, Deasy said it goes through October. The last one, I think this press secretary of HHS tweeted something that said, yeah, we're get, we're going to do that. Yeah. And then everybody's like, Oh, okay. There's going to be an extension. Okay. We got another 90 days, but then the, the actual declaration took another little while before it came out. So there's even yeah, some. I mean, I've also never seen a declaration by 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 tweet. You know, it t it typically <laughs> takes. There's so much. I, I I honestly, I've just you know because to a, a public health emergency declaration requires so much activity at the executive level. You're talking about pulling together a budget. You're talking about councils, you're talking about departments, it's usually more than one department. I just mentioned FEMA. FEMA is not part of HHS, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about sometimes housing, where you're, you know, the transportation. So it involves a lot of different executive functions that a declaration, um, you know, will, will, will touch on. And it just can't, you know, there's just so much work that goes into, and work and thought that goes into pulling together an emergency declaration. I mean, just on the health side alone, and Scott hasn't weighed in here, but you know, we've got a gap in testing, right? So if you're thinking long term about a public health emergency declaration, you you ought to be thinking about point of care tests, quicker tests and quicker turnarounds, even if it's not at the point of care or if it's home based tests. There's a lot that goes in there. That's funding. That's manufacturers you're you're connecting with. So it's um you know, it's just not, it's not something you can sort of just toss out. There has to, there hopefully should be a lot of um, engagement and thinking behind pulling together a declaration like that. So Scott, let, let's pull you into this. Um, have you been able to leverage uh, any of the, the flexibilities that have been afforded by the, the declaration in terms of testing capability or capacity? Uh, yeah, well, I think we've seen a couple of things happen. Um, obviously, laboratories have ramped up their capacity significantly. That means an awful lot more machines that are being brought into the labs that are uh, moving what are largely for COVID uh, PCR-based tests through their their natural processes. Um, that's had some, some bumps along the way, obviously. Uh, we've seen significant extension in turnaround times from some of the major laboratories. Um, but it has forced some innovation and it's also forced some uh, relaxing of oversight, which uh, has generally been a bit of a bottleneck. Um, most laboratory tests, I'd say the vast majority of laboratory tests that you would receive through standard healthcare um, are actually um, LDTs, lab developed tests, which mean that the specific lab that's running the test has created that laboratory assay and is providing those results under a regulatory body called CLIA. 
or regulatory uh, statute called CLIA. Um, it's not uh, mandated by the FDA that that laboratory test be approved by the FDA itself. The, uh, in recent years, the FDA has extended its reach a bit into the LDT space. And as of, uh, I think it was less than two weeks ago, HHS has effectively told the FDA to back off. So that has greased the wheels a bit for laboratories to uh, you know, get some new innovation uh, out into the market faster. Um, one of those which we certainly advocate for, which hearkening back to, to something Adese said, you know, we're, we're coming up against flu season. Um, what we have right now with COVID testing is a very myopic test. It will tell you whether or not you have the presence of the virus or not. It's not a differential diagnosis. It's not going to tell you you don't have COVID, what you do have is this instead. And that really is what we need coming into this flu season is to understand, you know, if you have a respiratory ailment, it's not just COVID all the time. Um, how do we treat that person in the best possible way um, if it's not? So an, an awful lot of what we've been doing is enabling laboratories to do exactly that, to bring differential diagnosis tests to market through that same technology platform. So, so through PCR testing, where we're looking at uh, you know, the presence of, of various bacteria um, and, and uh, other uh, biomarkers to really help them to understand how should I treat this person, COVID or not. Um, all of that has been greased by, I think, the both the emergency declaration, as well as just, quite frankly, the pressure that the FDA is under right now to, uh, to green light emergency, youth, emergency use authorization testing and really get this uh, under control as fast as possible. Um, I said a little earlier that uh, testing technologies are evolving, not just the collection methodologies, but also how we go about testing. You know, we have antibody testing, we have antigen testing, we have PCR testing, um, all of which are appropriate in different circumstances. Ultimately, what we need to work toward is what is effectively on-site, very rapid turnaround you know, 10, 15 minute tests. I go into a restaurant, they sequester me for 10 minutes. I take my test and they show me to my table. I mean, that's, that's really where we need to be. Um, and the technology is getting there. It's, it's certainly not there yet. And of course we'll have supply and manufacturing and logistics and all that to deal with to get that to be pervasive. But ultimately, you know, in the absence of a, a miracle cure or vaccine, which, you know, may be on its way, but uh, you know, testing is going to be the key but that testing has to happen, you know, when it's needed at the point of, uh, of actual necessity. So it's coming, it's coming. It's um, so we, we've really built this conversation on, you know, spoken about COVID and some of the issues um, about the election a little bit. So the third pillar during this period of time is the racial inequity that we've been experiencing and being in Minnesota, we have seen it it literally in the front of our eyes of what's happening. So Daisy, you know, brought, bias and prejudice have really been brought to the forefront these days. And we're finally being forced to address this. Bias and prejudice are as much a part of healthcare workers as it is in the general population. And also because healthcare workers are in positions of authority, with the power to exert influence on patients' experiences, the impact on health outcomes can be significant and long-lasting. And can you tell us a little bit about implicit bias and the impact that it has on healthcare? Yeah, no, this is such a critical topic. I mean, that if there's one positive thing that's happened over the summer, it's the fact that this has been forced to the fore of our national discourse, right? Because we've been talking, there are some of us who've been in this space for a while. Some have lived, some have been in it for as long as I've been alive. And this has been, um, you know, a subject of inquiry, academic inquiry and research. But thank goodness, right? It's part of policy discussions right now. And I think that's a good thing. Implicit bias is something we all have. Everybody has some sort of bias. Um, so I think the, the one good thing about talking about it is to shed this notion that anyone is walking around without any closely held biases. Some are uncomfortable, others are benign. 
Um, one of the reasons it's important in the healthcare setting is if someone is subject to biases against them that are negative and are not in their favor, it can have a, um, an adverse impact on, on their health. Um, and we've got plenty of studies to document it. So we, we, the, the science has moved on. We're not, we're, not, we're not talking about is this real or not. We know that women get poorer care for heart disease than men. We know that African Americans get poor care. The, you, you know, things that is, thing, um, treatments that you're supposed to be, uh, that you're supposed to receive are less likely to be uh, prescribed or delivered to, Af to black people in hospitals. Um, you know, pain, right? African American, this is like commonly known. African Americans uh, do not have um, access, they don't receive the same or adequate. Uh, levels of pain management when they interact uh, with the healthcare system. And that's after you adjust for everything. So race is the constant. So we have a whole host of um, uh, studies and evidence to show that this is a problem. And so why is that? When we talk about implicit bias and the fact that everybody holds this, you know, I'm from Iowa and um, I'm a Hawkeye. So the weekend, you're likely to see me in black and gold just because that's what we do. I don't live in Iowa. I left Iowa more than a decade ago. But when you're Hawkeye, you just you tend to be a Hawkeye for life. If I see someone from Iowa City or with an Iowa Hawkeyes t-shirt or sweatshirt, I'm likely going to cross the street and say something to them, right? Because I'm on the East Coast. If I see a cyclone, which is the other part of Iowa, I'm not going to say anything, probably. I'll notice that they're from Iowa, but my bias is against the cyclone and very much in favor of the Iowa Hawkeyes. So now, what does that mean? It, it, it's sort of a light example, right? Because it's, it comes back to this notion of affinity. There aren't that many Iowans. It's like, you know, it's not a huge state. So if you see someone who's a Hawkeye in the East Coast, you, aut you automatically have a sense of affinity with them. You're much more likely to say something to them if you see their car sticker. The cyclone, I'm likely to miss. I might think it's some other school. I might, I, just the colors just don't even, you know, they just don't resonate with me. So I think when we understand that it is a human thing, um, I think we're much more forgiving of ourselves and we are probably more likely to have open discussions. So if you grow up in an American society where there is so much negative information fed to you about whomever, immigrants, African-Americans, older people, right, depending on what community you come from, the awareness of it is the first step to trying to check yourself and check some of your assumptions. When you do come across that an individual from that community, if you are a nurse or a doctor. But I think that's the first step. It's recognizing that we all have biases. They are mostly sort of implicit as opposed to you coming out and saying, I don't like this person or this group of people. Um, the awareness, the training, how do you go about trying to identify? Because it's also, it's one thing to recognize. It's another thing to hold ourselves accountable. So accountability comes in many forms not just training and making sure everybody goes through the training necessary. And those trainings are developing and getting better as we speak. But maybe we should think about our payment systems, including some measure of equity so that we are holding ourselves accountable for, for equitable care, delivering equitable care to all populations um, that, we, that we serve, making sure that we are hiring a mix of providers, nurses, physicians, to serve the diverse populations that we are ultimately serving. I know that um, Shantanu Agrawal and I wrote a piece on this in Health Affairs at the beginning of the year. We talked about chief health equity officers. If you are a large plan or a large employer, because I'm starting to see this, large uh, integrated delivery systems are in embedding or creating this role of a chief health equity officer, it's got to be someone who's got some resources or access to resources and power so that when they do find inevitably areas where we can improve, they have the agency within that institution 
to institute some changes, to try to make things a little bit better. And they need space to fail. Everything we try is not going to succeed at you know, the first shot. So how do we then make sure that we have a learning system within our own cultures to actually make a dent? Because as we can see from last week in Wisconsin, we've got a long way to go. Just every time you turn around, it's one thing. So um, there's a lot of room for improvement, but I do think um, implicit bias is just about recognizing those things within ourselves that we can um, we can sort of I identify and and act on as a way of hopefully realizing just a better society for everybody. That it's so important. I um you know as we've seen the evolution of healthcare, we see different lenses through which we view healthcare. Some is customer experience, some is outcomes. I really think that the next lens is going to be how do the products and services play and impact implicit bias and that's going to be really a key feature in you know moving forward products for a population especially as we we talk about social determinants of health which does span that you know spectrum dealing with implicit bias. Andrew I'm going to I'm going to give you the last question. Um, your Papa Pals and members, they meet, they may have not met before, they may have a um, developed relationship, um, but it is personal and one-on-one. -on -one. How have you dealt with implicit bias in shaping the attitudes of both the, the Papa Pals as well as the members in this relationship? Yeah, it's a very interesting thing to take older generations, some that definitely have some implicit biases for many, many years, and then pairing them with a younger generation, most of which are millennials or younger that are, you know, in my experience, at least with Papa Pals, pretty open and, you know, culturally diverse. And we have pals and members from different languages, different backgrounds, different races, different countries. Um, you know, some of the older adults in certain communities are scared. They're not sure what's going on. Um, some are from, you know, African American culture, seeing what's going out in the community, and they don't know how to react. And uh, to be able to pair them with a pal from their same culture, obviously, is helpful so that they can, and a lot of times it's not on purpose, to be honest, it's more about pairing them for personality. Uh, but it allows them to talk through an experience they had, you know, a nine year old man had an experience 50 years ago and a 20 year old uh, kid uh, having an experience now and how they handled it back then and versus the impact that they've been able to have on their community. We also have some older members that you know do have some negative biases, which is super unfortunate. And we've gone out of our way, honestly, in the earlier days of Papa to change their mindset, which doesn't always work. Uh, but actually, it's been incredibly positive for the most part. And I think there's just older stigmas that are, are frankly wrong. Um, and so that's been really nice to see that we're able to push the needle on that. I mean, Papa's an incredibly diverse company, our board. Uh, we have people from different countries, uh, different genders. Our executive team, you know, same thing as well. Our company is, I think, 50% or so African-American. You know, obviously, I'm a white uh, Jewish person. But for us, it's really important that that's not part of what we're doing because really our whole business is bringing together two generations that are incredibly distinct. Um, and with that comes different cultures and different backgrounds and languages. So we have actually gone out of our way to remove some of those issues. And, you know, frankly, I think it's actually made some of the older members feel much more comfortable. A lot of them are stuck in their house. They see the news. They're watching, you know, Fox or CNN, depending on their preference. And their viewpoint is exactly what's coming out. I mean, even uh, like my step grandfather, he, you know, reads, he doesn't realize it's fake, but he's 90. And these are like fake news, literally not, you know, actual CNN, but like made up things. And um, he doesn't know. And so to be able to tell him like, hey, this is actually you know, like a made up website, um, like maybe you should think about it this way, not telling them they're wrong or right or what have you, but just perspective is what we think about. And uh, it's really important and it feels nice. I mean, we're helping older people for free. We're paying younger people, uh, especially in the time of COVID when there's like 35 million people unemployed. And that's across the races and religions and backgrounds and languages. Um, and, you know, early on, we would say that everyone's a papa pal. And a papa pal is a person that's young, fun and energetic. Doesn't mean you're 20, you could be 40 but you're young and your vibe and you're energetic and your vibe and you're honest and trustworthy and, and open. So it's been a critical part of our mission to support families throughout the aging journey. And that's not one type of family, that's all families. And it's been really important to us and, and to me particularly. Um, and that's just how I was raised and I never knew anything different and I'll continue to push that forward.
Wow. I, I, I thought 40 was definitely the young, fun, and energetic, and, and that yeah, was the... It is, it is, it is. It is. I well, fit squarely in between a pal and an older <laughs> member, so... <laughs> Got it. Well, thank you, guys. I always learn so much from all of you, and just really appreciate the perspective. It has been truly a pleasure. So thank you for, for joining us and for the thoughtful um, answers and discussion. Um, it's been great. So Ryan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, for anybody who hasn't submitted questions, you can submit them. Uh, remember, you can, you can use the Q&A function. That's the preferred route. Um, we have a few questions coming in. Uh, the first one I think is, looks like it's directed towards Craig. Um, but can states offer their own waivers without federal waivers is the question. Um, well, Medicaid is a state federal partnership, so they can definitely design their own program with their own money, however they would like. And some states do do that. They have a portion of their program that is purely state funded. And that doesn't take federal um, approval for the state only funded portion of that program. But in large measure, Medicaid is jointly funded by the state and federal government and you need that federal approval for the larger Medicaid program within your state. Another one of the questions was, uh, I think this is to Scott, there's a lot of discussion around, there's a lot of discussions today around testing timing. You touched on that. Um, what do you see as the delays or ways to improve that? And I think you mentioned something about the technologies getting close. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the delays are just a natural overburdening of the existing infrastructure um, from lots of different perspectives. Uh, laboratories, even the biggest labs in the country, uh, never prepared to do, you know, 50,000 of one test a day. Um, so they're all scaling up. They're all uh, trying to improve supply lines. Uh, we will certainly meet that need nationally um, at some point. But in the meantime, you know, test return times are getting longer, um, depending on who the, the provider is. But uh, we, we are certainly taxing a system that never envisioned having to pump this many tests through uh, a very, what was a very narrow tube. Um, that said, you know, it's, it, it, it seems uh, dichotomous, but the, the same time, those same laboratories are furloughing people because all of the, the routine testing dried up, right? People aren't going to their doctor as much. They're not going into the hospitals as much. So, you know, they're not doing the cholesterol tests and the standard blood works and, and all of that. So, you have this sort of weird thing happening in the laboratory industry right now, um, but I think it's normalizing. So we're, we're starting to uh, really see the, the catch up there um, from the perspective of, of having the infrastructure required to do the necessary testing. Um, I will say though, that as companies, as, as the disease wanes, we're going to see a new wave of demand because we're going to have more and more companies trying to bring their employees back into the environment and that really will put a whole new burden onto the testing process. You know, my own company, we've been working remote since mid-March. Mid um, we've not tested anybody because everybody's been uh, at their home. As we bring people back into the workforce, you know, we've, uh, we've really focused on a personalized medicine approach to testing, um, really testing those people that need it when they need it and helping other organizations to do the same thing. So rather than have this kind of one size fits all testing policy, it's let's really look at the exposure risk and the health risk of individuals and the progression of the disease across the country and see who really requires testing and when they do um, so that we can utilize that infrastructure for testing in a way that's smarter rather than just throwing more tests at it. Um, so it's going to be challenging for quite some time, but I think we're going to see this new wave, quite frankly, as, as the disease progresses, um, that, that's going to really overburden the system yet again. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the questions we got, I think we've got in each session so far is, um, if you're a health plan and you're looking for a place to start with, whether it's a waiver or something else, if you're looking for a place to start, where can you start where you're going to get the best bang for your buck? And I don't know if that's directed towards Adeze and Craig predominantly, but uh, maybe start with each of you. Well, since the topic of, one of the topics, I think Sarah was reminding us, because we, we did really touch on everything, but the anchor for this was social determinants of health. Um, I would start there. I mean, that's everything we've talked about, Craig and the population, his plans serve, you know, face the greatest uh, challenges with social determinants of health, same thing with 
with with Scott and 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 certainly Andrew. Um, so I think it would really be about the agenda. If I'm a health plan, from the health plan CEO, I want to sit down and think about what's my health equity agenda. I'm using health equity deliberately here, because um, that's 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 the goal. Disparities and social determinants is a focus on the problem, but the goal is to advance health equity, make sure that we are doing the best we can for everyone, right? Um, so what's the agenda? And if you don't know, I think that's okay. We, it just means you need to get the right people at the table um, to tee up those questions, do the internal um, um, sort of uh, data analyses that will be required, figure out what resources might be best um, directed towards the problems. I think, I think everyone should try, I think everyone should try to compete and win um, against all the other health plans or payers. This is the space to want to get ahead as opposed to trying to play catch up, right? In the next two to three years, because this is the issue of our time. Social determinants of health, health equity, addressing disparities. You know, sometimes a generation doesn't call for the problem and the problem just sort of comes to you. And we're seeing it from every single angle uh, in this society, and it's just coming at us. And I think that we just have to we just have to meet the the call of the day. So that's that's what my first it task would be is to try to figure out hire the right leadership, and try to figure out what we ought to be doing within our own organization. Yeah, and I we could probably spend another hour on implicit bias, but I'm going to back up for just a second. I'm going to answer your question, Ryan. I promise, but. Um, uh, I want to throw in there um, uh, income levels, which is uh, how you see poor, lower income individuals, how you see people in public housing, how you see homeless, how you see migrant workers, how you see uh, people on the free lunch program. I grew up on the free lunch program, just side note. <laughs> I grew up on the free lunch program. Sometimes we would make it all the way to the reduced price lunch program when my parents were both working. Um, and there's an implicit bias against people that grow up a certain way, as Adizia pointed out. Um, not just Cyclones versus Iowa. Um, I'm from the West Coast, so they're all bad, just to let you know. Just to let you know, they're all from Iowa, so we fight those guys. But, but the income levels and how you're insured is an implicit bias that we have to address. You're on Medicaid. Oh, how many Medicaid people do you see, right? Oh, how many of these, how many uninsured, how many folks, why are you uninsured? There's this implicit bias that just is in folks that we need to break out of. And boy, I would love to make it a competition, as Adizi pointed out, to see who could do the best job, who could move that forward. And it is to a certain extent, but it's on this macro level at the state level, and they compete with managed care in the Medicaid space. But, but this implicit bias goes really deep. And, and, and in the Medicaid space and the low income and in the, in the poverty spaces of our country, there's an implicit bias about how you live. There just is, and it's horrible. And, uh, and, and right, I'm on the free lunch program. Do you, you wanna make that assumption about me? Go ahead, you could try. Um, yep, I did grow up in a single wide trailer, but you know what? Let's have at it, let's see how it goes. Um, let's, you know, there's just, it, there's just an bias about it and, and having, as Andrew pointed out, having people that understand and empathize and, and, and come from a background and can share a story with those folks opens up a world of healthcare that is different. And we need to have that. We need to have that. So to your question, Ryan, about what the next first steps are, it's going to be individualized to that plan. Everything has to be. You have to sit there and say, yep, I'm a, I'm a regional plan in North Carolina. Um, okay, what, what are other regional plans doing within my state, within the whole country? Where, how can I learn from them and what they're doing and what, but then it, it is going to come back to the data and metrics within your population that you're serving. And how can you best do that? How can you best do that? Maybe it is giving out 20,000 iPads. Maybe. Um, it might be something completely different, completely different within the social determinant space, health access space. There's a whole range of things. So I don't think there's one answer that I would say, oh, go buy iPads for all your people. So that might not be the challenge that you're looking to address, but definitely, definitely learn from the peers in the space. Um, because as Adizi pointed out, this is, this is going to be, we're going to look back on this time and see who did the best job. And, and you're going to look back and, you're, and then people are going to say, oh, those people succeeded in a really challenging time. Um, let's stick with those folks. 
right? Those people that made it through this challenging time are the people that are going to keep going. So um, learn as much as you can, but individualize that response. Thank you. And thank you to everybody. Uh, we're out of time for now. If there's additional questions that came in, I know we're going to put up some contact information here. So if people can have a chance to outreach to you, here's some contact information for everyone. And uh, we can circulate some of the questions as well. But now, as we mentioned before, we are going to continue along with our innovation lab. And Scott McGill, President and CEO of Coriel Life Sciences, who you just saw as a part of the panel, is going to be talking about game changers in SDOH. Uh, and so, Scott, he will be taking questions throughout the presentation. Just so, again, use the Q&A function as a part of it, and I'll be keeping my eye on that as well. But with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. And again, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Ryan, and uh, thanks everybody who participated in the panel. It was a, a really great discussion. Looking forward to staying in touch with each of you. Um, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. This is actually not COVID focused. This is uh, a little bit of a discussion on what we at Coriolis Life Sciences do during our non-COVID day job, which is uh, really implementation of precision medicine programs. Um, most of what we've been focused on in the last four or five months, of course, has been the application of those, those basic tenants to the COVID pandemic, but uh, underlying that is really science, technology, processes, and ecosystem that we've built up around uh, medication safety and precision prescribing. So uh, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide. So the, the problem that we are uh, typically focused on is around uh, prescription drug management. And th this isn't about how do we get drugs cheaper, but rather how do we ensure that the medications that are being prescribed to individuals are really the right ones for them? Um, now that is a, a, a pretty uh, big problem, right? This is a, an issue that, that kills more than 100,000 people a year in the US, more than 2 million uh, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, um, not because doctors are, are making lots of mistakes, but because they quite frankly don't have enough information to make the right call all the time. Um, we know for sure, and if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide there, um, we know for sure that your unique physiology, your DNA has a lot to do with whether or not certain drugs will work as intended for you. Um, that science has been termed pharmacogenomics. And what that really means is looking at uh, particular portions of the genome that we know to be hyper variable that have evolved over time to help our bodies to cope with different toxins that we might come in, into contact with. What that really means when it comes to pharmaceuticals is that the same drug, same dose for two different people uh, can behave wildly different. And generally we can look at that as, you know, the drug can be safe and effective. The drug could be safe, but completely ineffective. The drug could be effective, but unsafe, meaning that it's doing its job. So uh, imagine a cholesterol medication that is doing a, a good job at lowering your cholesterol but at the same time, it's, it's causing you side effects and uh, other issues with organs that uh, mean that it's really unsafe for you. And then finally, drugs that are uh, both unsafe and ineffective. Now, the, uh, the result of all of this, of course, is that um, we've got lots of medications that are being prescribed as what are essentially experimentation, right? A doctor prescribes the standard dose hopes for the best, asks the patient to, you know, let me know if you have any trouble and we'll see about uh, dosage change or switch to another try. Um, the problem is pervasive, uh, if you go ahead and move forward. Um, but this isn't just a silver bullet solution looking at genetic testing. So there's no, you know, magic uh, spit in this tube and I'll tell you exactly the right pill. Um, because we have such a high degree of polypharmacy in this country, so so many people take so many different pills, and those pills interact not only with uh, an individual's genetics, but also with the other pills that they're taking, with the foods that they eat, the things that they drink, the things that they smoke, um, as well as lots of other factors like what are the conditions they suffer, um, is there are there issues because of their age or their pregnancy status or any number of other uh, concerns, what really needs to happen in this process is that all of these factors need to be taken into account together to better tune the medications for those individuals. And that's a combination of certainly laboratory testing. So that is, you know, this pharmacogenomic testing that 
um, over the last decade has really been honed to uh, incredibly rigorous science, very cheap, and something that can happen uh, very quickly. But the answers that are, are derived from a laboratory test are not sufficient for really making a true medication decision for someone. They can help steer, they provide one factor, but you really need then medical practitioners, and we advocate for pharmacists, trained pharmacists to be those practitioners that can help the prescribing physician understand how to actually make use of all this data. So the result of that, if you wouldn't mind moving ahead one, um, the result of that through clinical decision support tools is really a medication action plan recommendation from that pharmacist. So a genetic test is taken by an individual who is having some issue with medications or polypharmic. The, the results of that come back into a decision support tool that's then reviewed by a team of pharmacists. And the result is we believe that this is a better alternative medication for this patient because they have a genetic concern here, or this is a better medication for this patient because it's not going to interact poorly with the six other pills they're taking or the fact that they drink grapefruit juice every morning or any number of other concerns. And this is a constantly evolving knowledge base. So new information is coming from the FDA, the drug labels, the CDC, the AMA, um, all the time, as well as this constant body of knowledge that's evolving through the study of genetics. So this really needs to be a live process. This needs to be something that creates a, a shield of vigilance around those individuals so that they can uh, ensure that no matter what changes occur in their healthcare or their medications, they're getting the most tuned plan for them. So go ahead and move us forward. So just a little bit of a case study here. Uh, the Teachers Retirement Systems of Kentucky which, uh, began working with us in around two and a half years, three years ago. Uh, 36,000 retired teachers. They were interested in ensuring that those teachers were receiving the best possible prescription plans that they could um, so that we could help again to address both the rising cost of medications, the rising cost of health care, and also more importantly, um, make sure that those individuals can return to good health as fast as possible. So through that process, uh, at the time in which this, this kind of snapshot was taken about 5,300 or so members had opted into the program. They received a saliva collection kit in the mail at their home. Um, they submitted that sample back into the, uh, the US Post. Off it went to one of our network of laboratories. The lab did the genetic testing and then sent the results into our clinical decision support tool for review by a team of pharmacists. So the results of that were about 3,400 of that 5,300 required an immediate change of their medications. And that's pretty significant given that, you know, these are uh, individuals who have full health care coverage. Um, they are under the care of both a TPA and a PBM. Um, there are processes in place that help those, um, those practitioners to tune those medications, but nothing as comprehensive as this. So it's a pretty significant amount of, of change required. And about 1,500 of those was purely because of genetic concern. Now, this never would have actually come to light for those physicians if they hadn't run a test like this. So it's a, a pretty significant advance in how we actually decide what the right medication should be for an individual. Go ahead and move forward. So when we think about what this means from a social determinants of health perspective, uh, two just illuminating uh, maps here, the map on the left gives us a, a sense of the diversity of minority populations across the US. So it's not surprising that, you know, where we have kind of hotspots of prevalence of minorities, um, those overlay almost identically to where we also see high poverty levels. So when we think about genetic code versus zip code, um, there's no doubt that the availability and access to this kind of innovation is more restrictive in populations where, um, quite frankly, the healthcare is not provided uh, with as much freedom or as much uh, access as it would be elsewhere. Um, there's some other challenges as well, so if you would mind moving forward. Um, most genetic science is based on data that was derived from Caucasian populations. That means when we look at the association between a genetic variation and an outcome on, let's say, a, a drug, um, most of that science was done on populations that are predominantly white. 
Um, now that doesn't mean that the genetics are wrong, what comes out the other end of that study. What it means is that the percentage or the frequency of that variation is going to be potentially significantly different in different populations. So an example, the, the drug Plavix, which is one of the world's best selling blood thinners, um, that drug doesn't work in about 27% of the world's population. So me, I'm a, an ultra rapid metabolizer on the gene CYP2C19. That means that my body will not process that drug effectively enough for it to be uh, a therapeutic, to, for it to achieve its therapeutic intent. So I should not take Plavix. I shouldn't do it. But I'm one of that 27% that came out of a Caucasian population study and many of them now, it's been replicated many times. But if I were Asian Pacific Islander, um, that percentage of non-effectiveness is about 50%. So it's a matter of frequency, not actual uh, association of outcome. But that's significant. When we think about uh, some of these, these rare uh, variations and associations, um, they may be highly prevalent in some uh, populations, whereas they're essentially overlooked in the more general Caucasian population data. Um, genetic testing in general is fairly early stage in its adoption. Most payers are still evaluating the value of, you know, do we test someone for uh, either oncology predilection or treatment or, you know, things like pharmacogenomics or Mendelian condition carrier, carrier status. Um, all of these things are fairly early stage yet, and there's a high degree of variation across the, the payers. Um, now, this is, I think, starting to, to swing uh, a little bit toward the um, more adoption on pharmacogenomics. Um, we've had some very recent publications and uh, guidance from the FDA on what really is rigorous science and what should be looked at. R right now, the FDA prints uh, uh, pharmacogenomic warnings on almost 200 drug labels, and yet we still have uh, an awful lot of payers that don't, uh, don't actually pay for pharmacogenomic testing. Um, healthcare in the U.S. is event-based rather than proactive, which means that what we're seeing in many cases is we test people when they have problems. Well, with something like pharmacogenomics, it's almost like allergy testing. You actually gain tremendous benefit by testing proactively so that we know what to avoid in the future. And the healthcare system is generally, from a payer perspective, not set up to do that. And some of that, I think, is largely due to the fact that people switch payers all the time, right? Longitudinally, a payer may not actually get the value out of a proactive test versus something that's reactive. In reality, having that information as part of that person's healthcare record becomes a benefit that any payer has any time they've got that member. On the advantages side, genetics don't change. We test once, we can leverage that for life. Those results are portable. They can move from carrier to carrier, from uh, clinician to clinician. The results are quantitative. You, you don't argue with the fact that I'm an ultra rapid metabolizer on CYP2C19. That's not going to change. It's not a matter of subjectivity. Plavix won't work for me. Um, and COVID will dramatically increase the general testing capacity. So we are bound to see an economic improvement over the laboratory test component of this overall process. Um, I'm gonna pause there. Hopefully I left enough time for some questions. Uh, Ryan, if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind, that'd be wonderful. Yes. Um, so one of the questions that came in was around interpretation. So are there, this question was, are there interpretation training gaps with pharmacists who have to interpret the results of the test? Yeah, um, we really don't expect pharmacists to be the ones that have done all of the study. I mean, quite frankly, uh, it's not a one man job. There are uh, consortiums like CPIC, the Clinical Pharmacogenomics Implementation Consortium, uh, there are groups like Coriel Life Sciences that employs its own process for the rigorous evaluation of clinical utility and, uh, and scientific rigor. Um, and there are, of course, get, there's guidance from the FDA all about how do we interpret what the lab said. That really is why what we've positioned ourselves to do is be that, that uh, interpreting body, that consultant to the consultant, so to speak, so that we can empower pharmacists with the answers rather than force them to go do research. Um, that research could take weeks for an individual versus it's instantaneous in real time using a clinical decision support system. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll say that the maps that you, that you showed up there, it's troubling. So thank you for shedding light on that as well as sharing more information about what you do, what your organization does. Um, hopefully this is something that everybody can get to take advantage of regardless of where they are in the country and where they, uh, their socioeconomic status in the future as well. 
So I just want to thank you, Scott, for taking the time and for sharing this information with us. I want to thank all the attendees for joining this week. As you are exiting, there will be a survey that pops up. As a reminder, uh, you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 charitable donation. Uh, we have had a few, uh, the donations that we've done in the past, we've seen people donate to their local PTA, to local youth sports organizations. So please take, you know, we do take all the comments seriously, so please take the time to fill out and put some comments in related to that. Uh, as a reminder, today's session was recorded and it'll be available on revupshow.com and we hope to see you next week for the final group uh, for our final week which is called bold innovations and in sdoh and what to expect next so thank you again for everybody for joining this week